are in a hybrid meeting, meaning Zoom, and we have a few people present in the room. Uh, so with that, let's do a roll call. Council Member Kim Daughtry. I'm here. Council Member Joe Marine. Council Member Jared Mead. Council Member Tom Merrill. Here. Thank you. Mayor John Nearing. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Labor Representative Lance Norton. Here. Thank you. Council Member Sid Robert. I'm here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Council Member Jan Schwedy. Here. Thank you. Mayor Nicholas Smith. Here. Thank you. Council Member Stephanie Wright. Here. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair, we do have a quorum. I'll quickly take roll call for our alternates. Council Member Mike Gallagher. Council Member Christiana Johnson. Mayor Kyoko Matsumoto Wright. Here. Thank you. Do we have Council Member James McNeil? Or Council Member Nate Nearing? Chair, that concludes roll. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is public comment. We have no written comments received and zero people are signed up to speak. So what I'd like to do is call out to find out if anybody wants to speak and please raise your hand so we can get you. You have one, who is that? Mr. Joe Kunzler. Mr. Joe Kunzler, uh, you're, are he the in yet? Hello. Mr. Kunzler, I did, go ahead, you have three minutes. I'm not gonna need three minutes, sir. But Mr. Chairman, sorry. Um, attending from home today, uh, I've noticed the boardroom has people who are not wearing their masks. It is a federal requirement when you're on public transportation and in public transit facilities that you wear a mask. So this is your formal reminder to put on a mask or leave the room immediately. Thank you for your attention to this. We have to take this COVID very, very seriously with the Delta variant and all of that and be an absolute tragedy to see, you know, Rick and Rachel and some of the other good people down there unmasked and all of a sudden get the Delta and end up in the hospital. So just a reminder, take this virus seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kunzler. Uh, let's see, next, is there any others? That doesn't look like it, Chair. Okay, and I'll close the public comment and we'll go to the Chief Exec Executive Officer's report. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do not have a formal report today. Uh, so I will turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. We are going into presentations. <laughs> Is this the first? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> uh, that's okay, you can do that. Uh, facilities and base expansion update. Mr. Riegel, Prince. Uh, you know how much I like to talk, so I'm just <laughs> saving it for the actual oh, program. Okay. Uh, thank you, Council Member Schwedy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to just uh, kick off our workshop today uh, by thanking the board uh, once again for attending our groundbreaking of our Merrill Creek uh, base expansion project last week. Uh, we had great attendance and it was an opportunity to uh, see in action uh, the work of our planning team and, and, and June and her folks in particular uh, in advancing our base expansion. Uh, that project is part of a multi-phase facilities master plan and uh, we did get a lot of uh, interesting inquiries about all the pieces of the puzzle and how the facility master plan is doing overall with respect to its implementation. So we thought we'd start today's workshop with a refresher on that. Um, and uh, June is, is going to lead us through where we are overall and I want to once again just commend her for her leadership. Um, all of the components of the facility master plan are, are proceeding apace uh, and uh, we're doing well on schedule and budget. So and that's thanks in large part to, to her leadership and her team's capability. So June, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, board members. Um, and, and thank you for your time in hearing about the facility master plan. There's, there's a lot going on. 
Um, I, I have a lot of pictures here so I can show you the status and then um, be happy to answer any questions afterwards. So next slide, please. Hope this works. There we go. So the facility master plan pro, uh, projects, there are six separate phases with seven individual unique projects. And as kind of a reminder, the real catalyst for this whole program is the 2024 growth and expansion to meet link light rail. Some of our biggest need is in maintenance space um, with the Swift Orange Line and the Swift Blue Line extension. We'll be getting 21 more uh, Swift coaches. And so we've got to have the ability to maintain that fleet and take care of it. And that then causes all the dominoes. In order to expand the maintenance facility, we need a new operations center, which we'll move to the building you're in now, so as soon as we can get admin out into a new building. So there's a lot of dominoes that kind of act together here. Next slide, please. So to go through them very quickly first, and then I'll, I'll take a little more time. Phase one is the new Cash Park Casino Road Administration Building. The new building's under construction. Next slide. Phase two is a transformation of the Merrill Creek Op admin building, which will be the new Merrill Creek Transportation Operations Center. Next. Phase three was actually um, split into two separate projects. Phase 3A is the west side of the building. So if, if you can kind of picture in your mind where the great hallway is, everything west of that is phase uh, is, is A, 3A. That's the expansion of six new bays, adding hoists in all 20 bays, expanding capacity for articulated buses within the facility. And then not really shown in the picture, it also includes upgrades to the fuel island and the bus wash in order to accommodate double deck buses at this, at this base in the future. The phase B of this would be everything east of the facility. So where all the offices are now, that will all be expanded and renovated in phase 3B. Next. And then I'm going to jump over to phase 6, which is the Linwood Transit Center Ride Store Remodel. Um, that facility is at capacity now. When Link Light Rail gets to Linwood, we're expecting almost quadruple in customer um, interface there. So we need to size the building to accommodate all that. Next. So back to phase one, the Cash Park Casino Road, our construction status. Um, I'm gonna walk you through some photos about 30 days ago and things have progressed substantially since then. But from the upper floor looking north, at the new entryway. This photo shows you what that entryway looks like. Next. And now standing below in that same location, looking south through the building through this great hallway with the, with the bridges up above. So you can see here on the left side, the rendering of this area. This will be the reception area that customers or, or contractors would come to present themselves. And then you can see the glass doors, which will be a secure location, and everything behind that will be where, where staff and employees work. Next. This is a view of the stadium seating. So uh, again, further south within the building, this is an area where we can have um, all employee, all hands meetings, where there'll be a large projection screen uh, a lectern or a, a stage of some sort so that if all employees can attend a meeting at the same time, there'll be plenty of seating here. And then there's also areas around the upper deck where people could stand and still get the same messages. So again, on the left, you can see the rendering of what it's envisioned. And on the right, you can see where we were about 30 days ago with building this out. Next. These two pictures are on the second floor, uh, again, toward the north end of the building, looking south towards where that great stadium would be. On the left side, you can see the rendering and on the right, the, the construction. And in, in this particular photo, the left side of this uh, second uh, deck would be where the planning department is found. And on the right side will be the executive offices. Next. 
So where we're at right now, we're approximately 60% complete on this, on this project. We expect substantial completion before the end of the year and the move in to the building is targeted for next February 22. Board member tours are being scheduled right now. Rachel will be reaching out so that we can show each of you exactly where we're at with the project and answer your questions. Next. Phase two, the Merrill Creek Transportation Operation. So once all of the staff that are currently in this building are able to move out, this building will be completely renovated and expanded and upgraded. Next. And just in, as an example on, on this, the new transportation operations building, uh, the rendering on the left is the employee, the operator break room where they would be waiting for their next assignments or between assignments. And the uh, rendering on the right shows you that there'll also be some nice outdoor space if, if people want to wait outside or, or conduct business outside. Next. So where we're at with this building, the status is that our design is approximately 95% complete. We're supposed to be at 100% by tomorrow, but I'm kind of hedging my bets a little bit. We're at 95% complete. Construction will begin in the second quarter of 22. Um, the, the only holdup on construction is again, the people who are currently in the building need out to the new admin center. And then this building will be under construction. And the move-in is targeted for third quarter of 2023. Next. Project 3A and B, the maintenance facility expansion um, 3A, again, is everything on the west side. So it's the expansion of six new bays, a new body shop and paint booth, um, enlarging some of the existing bays in order to accommodate articulated buses, new hoists in all of the bays, uh, a new area for storage of equipment and tools to make it easier for the mechanics. And then uh, Phase B is the east side uh, renovation of offices and, and more space uh, to conduct the business. Next. So status on 3A and B. Uh, 3A, we had our groundbreaking last Wednesday. It's, it's been a whole week since then. So it's, it's underway. Construction begins this month, July 2021. Um, 3A is actually a phased construction because we have to keep operations active and maintenance still working while we're building around them. So it will take a little bit longer in order to do that. And that is one of the reasons that we accelerated before phase two. Normally things go in chronological order, but we 3A, we need to have the capacity before more coaches are ordered. So that was accelerated. It was, it was split out of, the, out of the whole three project and accelerated so that we will have that, that space available. It's targeted for completion by the end of 2024. Meanwhile, 3B is going to begin design in first quarter of 22. And that construction is targeted to begin in the second quarter of 2023. Next. Phase four is the Cash Park Operating Base Renovation. Um, 2018, the ideas that we had for Cash Park have, have definitely evolved since then. And so we're not really sure what this design is going to be. We're obviously going to renovate it. We're looking at now the inclusion of an emergency operations center would be on this site. And as you are aware, we're going to be kicking off our zero emission technology study this year. So potentially different technology or fuel types could be accommodated at this phase. So at the moment, you'll see in the overall schedule that this phase has been deferred. We're including the budget for it, where it's still an active project, but we're going to be coming back to it as, as other pieces mature. Next. Phase five is the vehicle storage and training facility. We've come to you several times this year um, to get approval, to make an offer and proceed forward with a storage and training facility. It's a four acre parcel that's in proximity to our other bases. 3.5 acres of that is a usable land. So it's, it's a nice flat piece of property. 
The purchase agreement that you've approved has been completed and escrow is now open. Within our negotiations, we requested a 60 day inspection period of the property and we are doing soil samples and borings next week in order to ascertain that there is no contaminants in the soil. If we find something, we will be able to uh, cancel the contract and get our earnest money deposit back. But if the, if the reports come back negative, then we'll be proceeding to close the project or close the sale of the land by September 30th and begin our design immediately. Next. And then phase six, as I mentioned, is the ride store remodel in order to accommodate additional customers that we expect to improve our ADA access and also to improve our employee work areas. It's, it's very, very cramped over there, very, very busy. And, and so this will really expand it for future use. That design is also expected to begin in third quarter of 21. So we're, we're getting ready to bring this forward um, in the next couple of months to start this project. Next. This is just an overall schedule that shows how these stack up. Um, as, as I've kind of gone through them, everything is pretty well active. And uh, by this time next year, we'll be closing out phase one as we move in. We'll be starting construction on two. We'll be in construction on three. A. We'll be in design on three B. We'll be in construction on five and we'll be in design on six. So it's, it's a very comprehensive program they're all nested together and um, it's, it's all going forward. And so um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a couple. Okay, Dan. Okay, first of all, is it possible for you to send us uh, the slides via email? If you would yes. appreciate it. The other thing is, um, on the maintenance building out here on the east side and the addition of the offices, I've been out there. Is that enough room to do anything between there and the road? Well, the most of the people that are in those existing offices will be moving out. So much of that area now is dedicated to transportation operations and they will all be moving to what is currently the admin building. That gives us a lot of space to, to open it up, to add additional offices, to house um, our training program. And where phase five will be a training course, training still needs classrooms, still need offices. And so we'll be able to really renovate that space to accommodate. Okay, thank you. That clarifies. Anybody else have any questions from the board? Joe, no? Uh, I, I just think it's, it's very exciting. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of moving parts there, and hopefully it goes as smoothly as it was presented by June. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, let's, let's all, we're past 2020, and we move forward. Anybody remotely want to ask any questions? Okay, seeing then we'll move on. So Thank you. Long range training, long range training plan. Here I'm back in the Navy again. <laughs> long range plan introduction by the CEO. Uh, thank you, and thank you up. again to uh, to June for that for that great presentation. It sort of sets the the table for how we're looking forward to, to Council Member Marine's point. Uh, we're going to shift focus now to look looking even further forward. Uh, and talking about our long range plan update. Um, the purpose of today's briefing really is to help the board get prepared uh, for the process that will be upcoming. Uh, the long range plan uh, is an important tool for us. Our current plan has a 2030 planning horizon. So we need to uh, update our planning horizon to align with the regional planning horizon, which is 2050. Uh, we will have an uh, action item coming to the SACD committee and the board in August uh, to retain a consultant team to help us move forward with the development of long range plans. So today's discussion is really to help you get ready for, for that process. And, and that's gonna unfold over the next year and a half or so um, as we go forward. So next slide, please. I think Roland is 
advancing the slide. So as I mentioned, our current timing, our current planning horizon is 2030, <clears throat> and the PSRC uh, regional growth and transportation plans are, are aligned at a 2050 time horizon. So it's time for us to update and get in sync with our regional partners. Uh, the long range plan is a, a really important tool for us. This graphic you see it right is one that you've seen before. Uh, and it shows how our uh, planning processes and tools fit together. Uh, the long-range plan is an unconstrained aspirational vision, uh, and, and it expresses where we want to go long-term as an organization, uh, with key themes and values that inform our work. Uh, it then informs our rolling six-year transit development plan, uh, which you see each year when we update it. Uh, internally, that then also, the two of those things inform our, our annual business plan update, which is a rolling two-year internal business plan that guides our work in the management of the day-to-day -day, uh, agency operations. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it, it comes to ground for practical purposes in the annual budget process. So we've spent a lot of time with you, uh, of course, on the, on the annual TDP updates and annual budget process, so here we're stepping up to a higher level uh, to look out further. Uh, this is a really uh, interesting time for us, as you've been hearing in our board meetings and our committee meetings. Uh, we are making the pivot away from emphasizing our response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, it's still with us, and it's still important that we continue to do the things that we need to do to be safe, but we now feel like we have the opportunity to look forward. And, and plan and, and get ready for what's, what's coming. Uh, the long range plan is an unconstrained plan, uh, although I will have an, uh, uh, a priority uh, to make sure that we're art articulating a vision in that plan that we're confident is sustainable financially. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it aligns our planning approach with that of our partners. Uh, it responds to how you and we are seeing community trends in the future. Uh, and then it provides a roadmap for how we plan and deliver future service. And really importantly uh, to me and to the staff, it provides a framework to inform how we innovate and how we manage change. Uh, there's a lot of change on the horizon for us uh, as light rail comes up the corridor. Uh, that's going to be a game changer for everybody who uses the transportation system. What it means for us is an opportunity to rethink and reimagine our network within Snohomish County. So that's going to require innovation. It's going to require management of change. And that's very exciting. And this document will provide that framework as we look forward. Um, next slide, please. Just to, to review sort of how this nests with everything else that's going on in the region, there's nothing new here for you. Obviously, our, our planning approach and our practices here in the region are grounded in the Growth Management Act. Uh, PSRC is our metropolitan planning organization. They promulgate the regional growth and transportation plans, and then all of the jurisdictions of the, of the region align their plans with those. Um, and, and they're shown here in this ladder of, of, of planning uh, to the right. PSRC reviews all of those plans, whether it's our long-range plan, our TDP sound transit plan, municipal comp plan, uh, county planning, to make sure that there's consistency in all of those and that we're all generally uh, pushing in the same direction, implementing each other as we go. And this is our opportunity to do that at a strategic level for the next couple of decades. Next slide. So for the board and for the public, um, it's a really important document. Um, it'll have a public-facing component to it, but we're obviously going to want to reach out uh, and engage as many people as we can. We're going to want to hear from our customers. We're going to try to engage and hear from folks we don't hear from as often, haven't been able to engage with. We're going to want to hear from our city, uh, from your jurisdictions, from the county, uh, from our key partners, uh, and, and get uh, input and insight to help us answer some of these key questions looking forward uh, to inform uh, and position this organization for future success. So I'm encouraging 
board members to start thinking along those lines and thinking about some of the themes you want to try to capture in this plan that will guide our work on innovation, that will guide our work managing change, uh, that will position us essentially to provide a legacy for our successors, for our partners, for our writers. Uh, I think it's really important, and I know the staff is really interested in thinking about the customer of the future. Um, who are we going to serve in addition to who we're serving today, and how are they going to want to engage with the transit system? Those are really important questions, and we can address those in a thematic level and express our intent about answering those questions in the long-range plan. So it's an exciting time, and, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, I think we have an opportunity to, to seize the moment here as, as light rail arrives in Snohomish County and rethink how we deliver service uh, to our constituents. Um, I'm going to pause there um, and, and hand it over to Roland. He's going to start by sort of refreshing this board's uh, recollection of what's in the current plan and, uh, and what the process will look like going forward. So Roland, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Rick. Yeah, so um, just as a, a refresher on the current plan, uh, we adopted this plan back in 2011, and the plan was actually developed between uh, 2008 and 2010. And if you recall, it, during those years, uh, that was that was also the time in which we were in the depths of the Great Recession. So, so you know, the plan really started um, immediately after the the passage of the ST2 package by Sound Transit. And that was some of the impetus to um, for community transit to undertake an exercise like this was was to begin to uh, to be able to chart our own course as Sound Transit was beginning to chart its course into Snohomish County. Um, and then, of course, the the Great Recession hit, and and this became, in many ways, a strategic roadmap for community transit to help navigate both that reduction in service uh, that happened during the recession, but also how we grew out of it. Um, the plan has really set the table for the past 10 years of our of our service development and uh, and looking at this map on the right. Um, the, the map is it's you know it's been more than a decade since we developed this, but as I review this today and particularly note the, the blue lines on here which indicate corridors that we said uh, appeared to be eligible for BRT levels of service. This really is the swift uh, network build out map that we've been sharing over the past several years and it's and it's amazing when you look at this being the network that was projected for 2030 we're pretty well on target for meeting that objective. Um, and, uh, you know, the final piece of that being the gold line that we will uh, complete to the north in 2027 so um, so interesting to see how you know it really has formed a template and a framework to guide a lot of our service development and decision making over that decade. Uh, it also served as a, as a guidepost for our facility planning. Um, you know, many of the growth trends that were uh, originally projected in the plan have helped to inform things like facility uh, long range planning that, that June reviewed with you a few moments ago. Uh, also important was um, the collaboration with our partners, with, with all of you in your jurisdictions, you know, particularly at the, at the county and city level. Uh, this this was the first time that community transit really put a marker out beyond a six year planning horizon and back in the you know in the 2010 2011 time frame for us that was that was really a, um, a new place to be and it helped establish a new level of collaboration with partners in terms of long range planning. Uh, it um, established what we called at that time transit emphasis corridor so many of the lines that you see on this map. For the first time we were saying we're committing to long term service on these corridors and what that allowed was uh, local jurisdictions to begin also um, making decisions in their comp plans making decisions in their infrastructure investment on roads around that presumption of a, a permanence of public transit service and that's really been a game changer for us when we look back at um, you know, decisions like like Linwood's decision to invest in bat lanes on 196th Street, which will help support the Swift Orange Line. Um, when we look at, uh, you know, Snohomish County beginning to proactively make investments in a future park and ride and transit center out at Cathcart and Highway 9. Those are decisions that were um, uh, really uh, uh, accelerated and, and enabled by community transit saying here's what the future transit map looks like and here's where we're planning over the long term. So that has really proven a value in, in the partnership that we have um, 
with our jurisdictional partners. Uh, one thing that I, I like to recall is as we adopted the plan, um, it, it helped to inform many of the comp plans and the transportation element of the county's comp plan at the time. And I remember um, Steve Thompson, the former public works director for the county saying, uh, you know, something to the effect that, you know, that it's, it's nice to see that your plan is our plan. And, you know, they had a map of transit emphasis corridors that you could precisely overlay on ours. And it was obvious that each plan was informing the other. And that's really the goal of this work is that, um, that alignment that we were talking about. One thing I will just mention uh, before moving to the next slide is that uh, 10 years ago, this plan was largely focused on fixed route. And, and that is uh, primarily what it speaks to is a corridor development plan and a build out of BRT and other fixed route services. And as we walk through the presentation today, you can see that we're really casting a much wider net this time. There are uh, new technologies, new services, um, new factors that are really informing our thinking. And, and so we're going to be thinking bigger and, and beyond um, fixed route services. That will remain the core um, of the plan moving forward, but there will be many, many other things that, uh, that we will address and, and it will help to guide really all aspects of community transit's development over the, over the coming decades. So I'm going to walk through just a, a, a few uh, uh, pieces of information about what has changed, what's what's driving the need for uh, for a new plan. Rick noted the the planning horizon is now 2050. Um, Vision 2050 was adopted last year. I think you're all familiar with these growth forecasts. Um, you know, talking about 1.8 million more people in the region by 2050, 1.2 million more jobs. And um, you know, beyond the statistics, uh, there's a couple of pictures on the right. Um, you know, it's uh, it's amazing what's going on in Snohomish County, just in terms of the physical transformation of the landscape now with growth and development. And there's a picture there of one of the uh, developments in Linwood City Center uh, on the top. The one on the bottom is is a very recent photo um, of the uh, of the Cascade Industrial Center and the new Amazon distribution facility that's that's being constructed up there, just on a you know, on a phenomenal scale and, and at, a, at an amazing pace in terms of how quickly that area is transforming. Um, right now we're, you know, I think if you look around the county, there's, there's high density development that's occurring around future light rail stations in Linwood and Mount Lake Terrace. Um, I think we're all aware of all of the, you know, the growth around areas like Alderwood Mall with multifamily housing just, you know, popping up everywhere. Um, corridors like uh, 128th Street Corridor at I-5 and also the 164th Corridor around Ash Way. Uh, Rick and I have been out on, on visits to many jurisdictions in the past few months. And, um, you know, Lake Stevens, Marysville, Snohomish, Muckleteo, uh, Stanwood, Arlington, the growth is just everywhere we go. That's the consistent theme is, is growth and development. So, so a lot of that's new and, and our plan needs to account for that. And, um, and I think that's the conversation we've been having with all of you is, is wanting to ensure that our future service plans align with, uh, with current conditions and with future growth that we know is coming. The build out of the, of the regional transit system is, is another big factor driving change. When we um, adopted our current long range plan back in 2011, the ST2 program had just uh, been given the green light and stations in Linwood and Mount Lake Terrace were at the conceptual de design phase. We were moving into you know, that, uh, that really preliminary engineering. Um, now, of course, you know, we, we know exactly what they're going to look like. We've been uh, deep into the design process with Sound Transit so that we have a very integrated approach. And as you all know, who you know, have been traveling I-5, um, the line is evident, uh, you know, nearly all of the, uh, the columns are, are complete at this point or, or soon will be. The station is taking shape uh, at Linwood and at Mount Lake Terrace and in Shoreline. And, uh, you know, really implementation of this service is just around the corner um, in planning terms. So um, a lot has changed. Uh, we'll be connecting with Northgate in, in just a little over two months um, uh, down in, in Seattle. And so the transformation begins with, um, you know, with Northgate and then continues in Linwood. And we're already starting uh, the same conversations for the, uh, for the ST3 projects and the extension to, um, to Everett. And, and that will continue to be a priority for us um, uh, for, for the coming years. 
But including all of that in this new vision, uh, we now you know, know a lot more about what that looks like and what it will enable community transit to do in terms of redeploying services uh, within the county and, and um, really achieving what we've come to call a mobility dividend um, for our service area, where it, it will allow us to do uh, many new and different things that we didn't have capacity to do previously. We're also, uh, a lot of new technologies and services have, have, uh, have come into existence or have been developed in the past decade that we couldn't even imagine 10 years ago. And I think we're all aware of the, the pilot they were underway with in Linwood and you know, the opportunity to explore concepts like micro transit and other technologies. And we anticipate that that will um, um, propagate across our service area in, in different forms and in different contexts that will extend the reach of the traditional fixed route systems and, and complement them. The long range plan will, will incorporate um, many new and emerging priorities as well. Uh, we are moving beyond the, the, the crisis management um, phase of COVID-19 and now beginning to think about lessons learned and the long range plan will, you know, will incorporate that. We're, you know, we're realizing that uh, there will likely be some lasting influence on travel patterns, on um, on work patterns, things like telecommute that influence uh, what days or what time of day people are traveling. And, and that's going to be impactful for how we plan and design uh, future services. The um, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion is, um, is a, an emerging and important area of priority for the agency. We're equipping ourselves to, um, to be proactive in this area. And we also wanna be um, very mindful of identifying out in the community, who is our market and how do we effectively connect with them? There are people that we have not been able to reach in the past that we really want to prioritize and engage, not in just the long range plan process, but also um, um, in uh, making sure that they have access to our services. Sustainability is an important priority. Climate change is now becoming a, a daily conversation. We're really starting to see the impacts and in this last decade, technology um, has really matured. And as we shared in a workshop earlier this year with the board, we are now undertaking a zero emission fleet study, which will help to inform uh, how community transit can, uh, can design and implement um, sustainable services well into the future. June's gonna be leading that process for us for the next year and a half. That will be incorporated into the long range plan as we start to uh, gain conclusions or recommendations from that study. The market is changing as well, new customer and community needs. Um, nowadays, everybody or nearly everybody travels with a smartphone and there are new expectations about um, how people connect to transit, how they get their information about transit, how they move from one transit mode to another in a seamless way. And we, um, we're aware of those changes and we want to be very mindful of those and, and want to make sure that we're um, um, accounting for those in our, in our long range planning process. There's also uh, significant changes coming for workforce. We, um, you know, we know that our, our workforce is changing. Um, we, we live in a very competitive market and we know that just the, you know, not only expanding service, but even just keeping up with, um, with the turnover of the workforce is a, um, is a new thing for us. And we really need to make sure that we remain competitive in that regard. Some of the changes like new technologies and new propulsion systems will also require adaptation on the part of our workforce. And we're also seeing impacts of, you know, things like telework, for example, is something we need to account for. So lots of changes and the long range plan is another place for us to be looking forward proactively um, to think about what will our future staffing needs be and how can we make sure that we remain competitive um, in, in terms of being able to attract and retain quality people. Uh, this list is not comprehensive. I you know, put it on here to be representative of some of the things that are driving change and driving the need for a plan update. Uh, we do expect to learn a lot from technical experts that we will, um, that we will employ in the process and, and also from the community. So a lot of, well, a lot of the long range planning process is, um, is listening well and, and you know, really making the effort to engage effectively so that we can, uh, we can hear the entire community and, and also understand new trends in the industry. 
We had planned to, to pause briefly at this point before we proceed with the rest of the presentation and, um, and really engage to see if there's any reaction to this point and, and also ask uh, what new trends and changes in your own communities um, are you experiencing and, and um, having to contend with uh, in the coming decades. And so I might pause at this point and ask if there are you know, any, any comments along those lines in terms of um, trends here that you've seen that are being impactful in your communities or new things that we haven't listed yet. Anybody have any insights? Go ahead, Joe. Well, I can tell you what, in looking at Vision 2050 and some of those things and the direction saying we're going to have another 1.8 million people in the region and so forth, I can tell you, for cities like Buckle Field, we're basically at, at build out and there's a lot of pushback to uh, resistance, I might say, enforcing density within existing neighborhoods. And so I don't know, you know, if they're where they're planning on putting all the people. If you don't build it, they can't come. So, and because of, you know, restrictions and not being able to go further out, they're trying to force density within. And, and some cities, I think, are going to be very resistant uh, to that. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And I was just curious if you had, uh, on that one graph you were showing, I think it was 4.2 million, it was going to go to 5.8 or something, and it showed next year, but what it didn't show uh, is what did Vision 2030 say, right? When it was, so if you go 10 years back, what did they project and are we there? When they went back 20 years, what did they project? And, and that would be interesting to see have we been reaching or exceeding the projection? Uh, and that gives you a little bit of sense of, because I think it's harder to make those numbers to further you up because there's less and less buildable land. Does that make sense? Yeah, maybe I can answer that question for you. I was on growth management board when we did 2050, and all of their projections on the growth and everything, they did me. That's why they feel pretty comfortable with the numbers that they've set now. Okay. So they were looking back as they look forward, which is all yeah. good. Anybody else have anything? Uh, Mr. Norton? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just sitting here thinking about the future. And I remember when uh, Microsoft opened in uh, Kirkland years ago, and the, right? And the special service that we had to I remember drivers saying, why, why are we, you know, doing this for the dam? And pretty soon it, it became huge, it's just huge. And now I see close to where I live up north between the uh, Arlington and Marysville and unincorporated stand with that, that area there by Smoky Point and what's going up up there when I think there's talk about 15,000 plus boys and that's staggering and special service that may be required then go out to different areas or the you know property values have skyrocketed I mean it's, it's just an amazing uh, time in, uh, in our lives uh, to see it, this, this, this huge growth and stuff how it's 200 and somewhat businesses down in Seattle that are closed and gone out of business. That's just amazing. And the future down there is, well, troubled, I guess, is the best word to use. Anyhow, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, Chair, I, I, uh, Chair, I just, Go ahead. well, I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to say that uh, to answer uh, Joe Marine's uh, point, well taken. You know where are they going to build it? I, I believe that uh, we're seeing in North County that that quite a bit of that growth is going to come up here. And uh, one thing I would just hope that we stay because uh, it, it's kind of like we have two two worlds of transit, right? We have the South County that is you know mega busy, and then uh, we have you know Stanwood, Stomish you know, Arlington and other places that I believe in the 2050 plan will be a whole different world here in terms of, I think COVID is, has taught us that a lot of people, I think there's 
what did I hear? Like 40% of the people don't want to go back to work, uh, you know, downtown or whatever. So I'm just hoping in our long ways plan, we're keeping an eye on this, you know, the commuting areas too. And I'm sure you are. And I just want to make that point. Thanks. Thanks, Jan. Um, I was just kind of curious how, with the growth and with all the employment that's going in, especially in North County, uh, for bus routes for employment. I mean, that's going to be huge. But I also know that there's also a big group out there that's looking at how uh, we should be, I'm going to say, uh, transporting um, people who live way out in the dingle uh, into doctors and whatever grocery stores and stuff and how how you address two extremely different uh, ways of transportation. I mean that was for you, Roland. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say next, next slide is what I'll say. <laughs> Chair Doherty. Nicholas Smith. Go ahead, Nicola. So I'm not sure how, so sometimes my uh, brain works in weird ways, but um, as I think about Linwood uh, and all of the construction and the, the new development that we are hosting uh, with regard to housing. And in the city center zoning, uh, we are allowing these uh, apartment buildings to go up with uh, fewer parking stalls per apartment. And this, the community is in an uproar about it. And, and we frequently have people coming in saying, we are not a transit city yet, and we need a car in Linwood. And these people are going to have more than 1.7 cars, <laughs> and they're going to be parking on our neighborhood streets. Um, and uh, we just don't buy it that uh, they're going to uh, be intentionally using uh, transit and not have cars. So. I'm wondering, and, and maybe I saw you shaking your head, Roland, but I'm, I'm wondering whether some conversation with um, our community planning departments, um, uh, development departments, uh, to talk about, even if it's just a publicity thing, um, how might transit support developers not putting in so many uh, parking lots per unit? Uh, and, and developers don't want to do it because they don't want to pass that cost on down to the renters. And so it really is a cost saving for renters, but uh, the community just does not believe that we shouldn't be building lots and lots of uh, parking spaces for everybody, which of course is a huge land use. And then of course we have the problem in Linwood with the, with the train coming in, 20,000 people are supposed to be walking on it a day and there's 1600 parking places. I mean, it's still beyond me how we're going to be managing that. And I know our buses are coming through every 30 seconds or something. But um, anyway, just kind of a maybe it's a PR thing, but maybe also transit and uh, developers and our uh, community development departments have so, a mutual understanding and response to the community uh, with regard to how transit's going to support the, the, the growth of people in our cities um, and won't need more than one parking spot at their unit, if any of that made sense. Thanks. <laughs> I might, Mr. Uh, Smith, I might uh, provide a response just, uh, just on that in terms of um, one thing that we're certainly envisioning in the long range plan process is that we will engage directly with uh, with your city staff. So, you know, particularly public works and planning have always been a, um, has been a close connection point when we, um, when we get into this kind of planning process. And um, the other, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment here, but as we, uh, as we have talked about the 2024 network planning, which is a related planning process that will actually be out a bit ahead of this long range plan, 
that that has really been the you know that that will be the mobility dividend that we realize in many of our communities is, is you know is the ability to finally get to the level of frequency and utility on transit that really does enable many more people to um, to live without another vehicle, and so that you know it's uh, the Swift Orange Line is a big piece of that, and you know in terms of connecting many more places in in the the South County area and really beginning to form this this true grid network with the with the blue line and the green line, um, but other corridors as well, and so it's you know definitely I. Uh, I um, support the, the concept that you're talking about in terms of getting together and, and talking intentionally about that. Um, and I think the long range plan presents one of those opportunities. Council Member Merrill, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, yes, um, uh, Roland just addressed quite a bit of it, but uh, a lot of our focus so far has been uh, focused on the north-south corridors. And as the growth comes into the county, some of our east-west is going to begin to overfill as well. Highway 2 and uh, going through Snohomish and going between here and Lake Stevens and Marysville on the I-9, uh, those are going to fill up faster than uh, highways, I think, are going to be able to address it. And so I think uh, more frequent service, as Roland was talking about, uh, probably smaller venue vehicles in order to accomplish that, to match the size of the populations and then grow with that, I think are going to be important and always with an eye on uh, environmental sustainability is going to be important. Uh, I'm, I would like to see that the transportation reaches out in such a way that, as uh, we were talking about that cars are not as necessary uh, going forward as they are now. And so the a very big focus on a, a mix, not only between um, uh, community transit, but also other modes of transportation so that that all comes together in a better environmental and transportation scheme than really what we have now where we have a bit of bus and a lot of whole lot of cars on the road. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments so far? Uh, this is Kyoko and I wanted to, so can I talk? <laughs> I wanted to, um, um, piggyback on um, Mayor Smith and Linwood because we're getting those same things going on in our um, city with people uh, not wanting all the um, new apartments and townhomes near the light rail station to have less parking. And, um, and I've been promising, so I hope that community transit will um, back me up on this, that when, when we get the light rail, we're going to be getting all of these other um, um, little circular um, um, commutes, commuter. Um, so I just hope that um, everything is going to work itself out. They, they're, they're not believing me because it's not there. And I said, no, it's not there yet. We're not going to have all of this until light rail gets here. Um, so anyways, I just hope that we can all work all of this out together, um, because, um, people are mad. People are mad at, the, uh, I think ours is 1.5 parking space. Um, and everybody is, um, just, especially the baby boomers, they're the ones that, that want, you know, two or more cars and a truck. So, um, anyways, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Kyoko. Anybody else? Okay, uh, Roland, you want to continue that? Yeah, thank you. So uh, we talked there. We, a lot of what we talked about in that in that segment was really the um, the match of the the type of service to the level of development that we're seeing in the community and the, and the land use environment that we're serving. So. That is a, a big piece of the long planning process. Um, we're envisioning that, you know, and will really launch from a, a baseline on that 2024 service. So the 2024 network planning, um, you will begin to hear more about that as we get into the fall this year. 
Uh, our planning staff has been working for um, for many months on the, the early concepts for what that 2024 network will uh, will encompass, and and that becomes a more public conversation as we move into the fall this year, and then and then throughout 2022. Um, that will form the baseline for the work that we do in the long range plan, and then the you know we'll be projecting forward about what mix of services um, and mobility options will community transit be offering in the decades to follow. Some pieces uh, of that puzzle are clear. We know uh, we know a lot about Link Light Rail. Um, you know we know uh, precisely what's going to happen in 2024. We know um, uh, we have a pretty good picture of the of the ST3 projects and what comes following. Timing is you know it's obviously being determined um, right now. Uh, we know what we're doing with Swift BRT, and you know we've got a, a well articulated plan out through 2027 and beyond, and a, a vision for a, a robust network of frequent service on BRT lines in in some of the most urbanized areas of the county. Um, we also have, have made a commitment to robust frequent service on, on other major arterials um, throughout the service area. And so some of those pieces are, um, are, are relatively well understood. What, uh, what's new is this, this full range of mobility options that will allow us to be more flexible and adaptable and also get to places that we haven't been able to effectively reach uh, with more traditional bus services in the past. And so there's a huge opportunity there. And you know, we don't know um, the outcomes yet of projects like the Linwood Pilot, but we are confident that we're going to learn lessons there that really allows us to be successful moving forward with these new mobility options. Um, we're investing a lot in technology and connecting well with our customers. And we know that that's a big part of the future as well. Uh, and then there's the, um, you know, there's the propulsion of our vehicles and, um, and our, our sustainability long term, um, which will uh, which will also be a big part of this planning process. We, um, as we get into the plan, uh, we're going to be evaluating needs, and, and that's going to involve a lot of conversations with you and your um, your respective jurisdictions. We're going to be gathering input from across our service area. We will be developing um, a number of different scenarios for the future and evaluating different balances of service and, and emphasis in different areas. And that'll be brought forward for your review and also um, for review in, uh, by the public. The, the final plan uh, will be flexible and it will provide a strategic framework that will help to guide uh, our future service development. It will inform the annual updates to our transit development plans. And, uh, and then you know, we will start to deploy um, as the years go on. As major changes occur in the community, and you know, we've been talking um, a lot lately about what's going on with our uh, discussions with Everett in their Rethink Transit process, we'll also have to adjust course and update the plan, and, and that's assumed as well. Um, but we will be moving forward uh, over the next year on this process. And what I want to do now is um, shift to introduce uh, a couple of the staff members that will be working on this project. Um, Thomas Tamola is our uh, manager of planning, and Thomas's area encompasses uh, our uh, service planning, route planning, scheduling, and also our long-range planning. And this project will be uh, will be in Thomas's long-range planning area. And so, I just wanted to, to introduce Thomas, and I know he's he's uh, he's visible there for uh, for a moment. So. Um, introduce him. You'll be hearing more from Thomas in the coming months as we uh, as we put together workshops and other engagements for the board in the process. So um, so look for him in those in those uh, areas. And then uh, I'm going to introduce Sabina Araya, who is our uh, manager of long range planning in Thomas's group. And Sabina will be the project manager uh, for this effort. And so I'm going to um, hand the presentation off to Sabina at this point, and uh, she's going to talk a little bit more about specifics on engagement and the process that we will see moves forward. Thank you, Roland. Um, as we launch this uh, long range plan update project, we estimate a significant portion of the effort will be dedicated to public engagement. Uh, and Rick touched a bit on this earlier. We will work with our existing outreach process through our communications and marketing departments and anticipate our consultant will lead this effort with additional resources dedicated to ensuring a comprehensive and inclusive approach to outreach. 
So we will have uh, touch points along each step of the way in this process uh, with our existing customers, our future customers, the public at large, with our jurisdictions and regional partners, with various community groups, um, employers, and key stakeholders, and of course with the board, our executive leadership, and internal staff. It's important to mention here that uh, once our consultant is on board, we will spend quite a bit of time refining our public engagement plan, and we are open to suggestions in that regards in your thoughts at uh, both the next workshop on the topic or any time uh, through this process. We, we want to, our communities and our customers to have a strong voice in the process. Uh, there's lots of uh, things going on in the community, so uh, we are receptive to your suggestions and flexible as to the forums we might participate in that are existing or that we could create um, in order for that to happen. <clears throat> and next. In, uh, in the next couple of years, as you, as you know, we are pretty busy. There's uh, both annual processes that we go through every year and at least a couple of more major projects that will not only inform the final plan, but also offer opportunities along the way to utilize outreach um, efforts that those projects present and vice versa. So we want to maximize um, how we communicate with our community and through and for which projects. You are already familiar with our TDP process, uh, which is currently in its public comment period. The long range plan looks beyond the six year horizon of the TDP, but the direction of the TDP is the launching point for the long range plan. And in turn, the long range plan will direct future TDP updates and guide our future investments. Our budget process is coming soon. Um, and those two processes uh, are yearly and will come again next year um, while we're still in the long range plan update process. The zero emission study will provide information that will be utilized in the long range plan to guide the agency in its potential transition to a zero emission fleet. And the long range plan is a perfect opportunity to set those long term goals in lessening our environmental impacts as an agency. And uh, lastly, uh, Roland mentioned the 2024 network plan that is of great significance um, in this effort. Um, and will be at the forefront of our public engagement this year and into 2022. It will provide a major restructure of our routes and a new framework for serving our present and future customers. The service in the long range plan will be based on the assumption of the new 2024 network. So there will be significant coordination between these two projects next year. Um, next. This is um, the framework for the project uh, that will allow our consultant to deliver the final plan in the first quarter of 2023. It seems a bit far away, but as you may be familiar in your own jurisdiction with your own comprehensive plans, or if you've been through a similar process before, these large projects that are broad um, in scope tend to take a significant amount of time. And I would say that this tentative project framework uh, presents an optimistic time frame. So it's important to remain flexible. Uh, we will keep you informed and take direction from you along the way and keep the project moving at the same time. Today's workshop is where you see that orange we are here sign. Um, it is an introduction to the project and the significant effort we are undertaking in this next year and a half. From here, we are moving forward with procurement, uh, going to the SACDC next week with the contract award and move that to uh, an action item at your August board meeting. And we will spend the remaining of this year uh, consulting with you, with our executive leadership and internal stakeholders, conducting initial research, uh, preparing the public engagement plan, and creating the materials needed for that first phase of outreach. Um, 2022 is where most of the public outreach will happen. It's very ambitious, but we think we can do it. Um, the first phase is um, visioning and market assessment uh, research, 
uh, followed by creating service scenarios and options that we, we would present for feedback uh, for the public. Um, that phase will also consider resources needed uh, for its potential implementation. Um, and all of that will be folded into a draft plan, which is a third phase that will go through a similar process. And uh, each of those phases in involve uh, public outreach and coming back to the board and incorporating the feedback in your direction into the next phase. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we hope to wrap this effort um, in 2023 and um, have an updated long range plan that will guide our agency into the future. Um, that's like kind of a 30,000 uh, feet overview. And with that, I'll turn the mic back to Roland and uh, ready to answer any questions you might have. At this point, I'm gonna I'm just gonna stop screen sharing, and I think we're ready for any uh, discussion or conversation from the board. Okay, I say again. Anybody have any questions? Yes, this is Tom. I um, have a question. What does your do you have a vision of what the public outreach looks like? What conversations you will have? What tools you will use for the public outreach? At this point, we're um, we're just finalizing the the procurement. Um, and our I know that our consultant has um, has secured a, one of the research one of the public outreach and research firms that we've done a lot of work with. I would say that we. Um, we still need to design that project, but we do, uh, I, I would imagine we'll be employing uh, a number of channels uh, from online open houses to in-person engagement. There is a high priority on reaching some of the, um, uh, some of the harder to reach uh, more diverse communities that typically don't participate in our planning processes as, as, uh, as heavily. And so that's going to be a, a particular emphasis of the process. And, and some of that will likely require um, a lot of in-person engagement as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Roland and team. You did a great job as usual. I'm looking forward to this entire big project. Uh, it's gonna be the second time I've been through this. so. Uh, that's kind of nice to see how it uh, melds out this way. There are a lot of questions that I think that the board will be bringing up in the future because things are changing rapidly in each of our different uh, municipalities. So there's going to be some, uh, I think, give and take in here. So we're, it's going to be interesting to see how it works. Uh, so if you don't have anything else, we'll go ahead and move on. Thank you, Roland. All right, so the next thing would be the chair's report, which would be me. Uh, there is an opportunity for the board members to attend the American Public Transportation Association, otherwise known as APTA, annual conference, November 7th through the 10th uh, in Orlando, Florida. Many of you have attended APTA events in the past, including myself. Jen's been to two or three of them. I believe that Joe's been to some. I know that uh, Mr. Nehring has been to several. Um, and this particular one is their flagship public transportation event. It's an excellent for networking and education on, on transportation throughout the regions of the United States. If you're interested in attending this one, please contact Rachel by the end of the month. I will review the list of those interested and confirm the attendees. The budget for this is reserved for two board members to attend, but there is, if there is a greater interest, we can probably accommodate more. The 2022 APTA conference will be much closer to home. It's going to be held in Seattle on wow. October 9th through 12th of 2022. We're expecting many of the board members will be interested in attending that one. Our upcoming meetings and events, the next regular board meeting will be scheduled, is scheduled for August 5th at 3 p.m. with more information to follow on that meeting. With that, I would like, I don't have any other comments from the board, or from the board chair. I'll open it up to other board 
personnel so they can uh, do their report communication. Let's start with uh, Mr. Norton. I have nothing, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norton. How about Council Member Schletti? <laughs> if so, no, okay. <laughs> Council Member Marine, I mean, um, Council Member Marine. Uh, yeah, no, I have nothing. All right, let me look at my list here because I can't really see everybody on that thing. Uh, Council Member Sid Roberts. No, I'm good, thank you. All right, and let's go with Mayor John Nearing. I'm good as well, thank you. Thank you, and uh, Council Member Merrill. Uh, nothing today, thank you. Mayor Smith. No reports today, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Stephanie Wright. Maybe she had another meeting to go to. Um, <laughs> and that would leave us with uh, Mayor Kyoko Matsumoto Wright. Oops, I have nothing to add. Okay, thank you very much. Did I get everybody or am I missing anybody? I got everybody that was supposed to be here. All right, so with that, we have no executive session, is that correct? Correct. And with that, is there any other business that you brought before the board? Crickets. <laughs> okay. Great, then I'm, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate every one of you. See you guys. Thanks. All right. Again, again. 18 minutes back.